Several things are happening in rapid succession. Matt wakes up in a church surrounded by nuns. Karen is some drug guy's plaything, wishing and hoping that Matt will save her despite her ruining his life. Fisk is training in his speedo. Foggy gets a new job and makes more money than he or Matt ever did. Ben is writing a copy in his head since his fingers are, well, you know. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the right um, sound effect for that. Karen is slowly making her way to New York City. Fisk is sending someone to finally finish off Matt and Ben Yurick is maybe experiencing PTSD because of what happened to him, which is completely understandable. Karen is finally able to reach Foggy by phone, and they set up a meeting to catch up. Matt is still being taken care of by Sister Maggie and the rest of the nuns at the church, but specifically by Maggie. Ben has a chat with J. Joel and Jameson. Ben wants to give up on the Murdoch Kingpin story and Jonah just rips him a new one by delivering the best worst pep talk ever. But you know what? The Daily Bugle Jenner gives him an even worse pep talk. This issue is different from the previous ones because we jump around to everyone else's stories for just a moment and it's obvious why. Very soon, they're all going to converge on one another. Matt is still being taken care of at that church and Karen is being knocked around by her Don. At the bugle, Ben is still trying to save his neck and his wife's by doing just fluff pieces. It's at that moment that he gets a call from the crooked cop Nick. He's finally ready to come clean and tell his entire story. Unfortunately for old Nick, Nurse Ratchet decides to give them both a very special message. Elsewhere in some club, Karen meets up with Foggy. She reveals to him that she's a corn star junkie. She's looking for Matt to protect her. Foggy tells her what's been going on lately and that Matt's missing. Okay, I know that she's out of her mind right now, but why would she ever think that Matt would be able to save her? Or even want to save her? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why would he want to save her once he finds out what that she betrayed him? What, for old time's sake? That is, even if she ever does tell the part that she played in it. And there's a good chance that she wouldn't. After learning what happened to him, she was about to reveal to Foggy what she actually did. But she chickens out. Despite that, Foggy gives Karen a place to stay. Will this all blow up in Foggy's face? You bet it will. Ben Yurik keeps replaying Nick's death in his head over and over again and keeps remembering what Nurse Ratchet said to him. Still fearful to even say Matt's name, he even stopped his wife from saying it. Until finally, while sitting on a park bench, he takes off his cast and says, Matt Murdock. While that's happening, some of Kingpin's goons go over to the former Gladiator Melvin Powers costume shop to give him a choice. Make an exact duplicate of the Daredevil costume or they'll demolish his shop and start removing his body parts. Well, at least they were nice and eloquent while saying it. The issue ends with Matt's fever finally breaking and awakens. He thanks Sister Maggie and then asks a very simple question. Maggie, are you my mother? She says, hell no, sonny boy. He's like, you know you lying. Sometime later at Fogwell's gym, Matt is pounding the bag. While that's happening, the Kingpin is having a meeting with his counsel and one of them wants to discuss about the Matt Murdock issue. Fisk takes it well. He gives Mr. Switzer an um, retirement gift for his um, trouble. Ben York is at the police station giving his statement about how Nick was about to confess about his part in framing Murdock. At that moment, Matt finds out what happened to Nick and tells Ben and a cop that's guarding him from the station to a diner. The former Nurse Ratchet's real name is Lois and she was told that she did too good of a job. Because she killed a cop, Fisk is having her relocated to Arizona. She instead decides to relocate Ben. At this point, everything is starting to get ramped up. Ben calls his wife Doris to let her know that he'll be bringing home a friend. As that's happening, Lois is knocking on her door. As soon as Ben and the officer arrive home, Lois beats the living crap out of him. Ben is able to get away and finds Doris hanging in the bathroom. Matt arrives and takes out Lois, and Ben is able to just barely save Doris. When Ben gets out of the bathroom, he sees that both the cop and Lois are unconscious. 
he immediately knows that Matt's back. He then gets a phone call from Melvin Potter about what's about to go down, but Ben is still in a daze, so he just hangs up on him. Fortunately, Matt was still around hiding and hears everything. At the loony bin, Fisk is getting a cuckoo crazy McStabby guy out. He plans to put him in the Daredevil costume to maybe lure Matt out, perhaps. Matt is able to track down Melvin, and as soon as he gets off the phone, Matt in the darkness tells him to make another suit. Back at Foggy's place, Karen is having a severe case of withdrawal. Unfortunately for them, the guy that's been using her by the name of Paulo has also been trailing her. Is he trying to look inconspicuous? He looks like a down bad Dick Tracy cosplayer. Quick question, who is this minion for the Kingpin and why is he using $25 words? I'm willing to bet that half the people reading this comic at that time wouldn't be able to pronounce these words. I should know. I tried. Multiple times. Cops pull up on Paulo and then a gunfight starts and bullets start flying everywhere. Fisk has a couple men there making sure that Foggy and Karen don't leave the apartment. He plans to murk them and then frame Daredevil for it. That way there won't be anyone or thing for Matt left to return to. Unfortunately for Mr. Wordsmith here, the nut job decides to go off book as well as Karen because she knocks out Foggy. Another quick question, is it Frank Miller's intention for us to hate Karen? If so, then he's doing a really good job at it. Yes, yes, I know she did this to protect Foggy, but still. Well, now this is a surprise. As per Fisk, he's the one that hired Foggy and now he wants him dead. Fun fact, this was going to be an important plot point for a feature storyline. However, Frank Miller won't be right on this title for much longer, so it's going to be a long time before this plot point is resolved. Anyway, Paulo catches up with Karen, but gets shot and Matt goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bootleg daredevil. While Paulo is dying, he tries to take out Karen too, who's searching for some fix. Luckily, Matt saves her in time. The issue ends with Ben delivering an update on what happened shortly after the shootout. Unfortunately, Paulo isn't dead, but the police put him into custody and he's facing several life sentences. The masked nut job was found naked and unconscious. Now Ben is intent on finding out where Matt Murdock is and what he has become. The issue begins in Nicaragua in a helicopter where a muscular, overly armed American flag paint on his face man is about to save some hostages. The man is called Nuke. And this is the man that the Kingpin intends to take down Daredevil. Well, another one. The last one didn't work out. Nuke does his best impersonation of every 1980s action hero and takes out all the enemies. I mean, heck, even his gun has a counter for all of his kills. We're back with Karen and Matt. She's still crying. Looking at this page, I really hope they didn't sleep together. That would actually make things worse. In the park, Ben York and Foggy discuss what's been happening with Matt. You know, I like that despite everything crazy that's been happening, Foggy is gearing up to go back into court to clear Matt of all charges. Hey, fun fact. Apparently, Nuke likes a good beer. As long as it's American. Yeah! Why am I not surprised that Fisk has the police commissioner in his pocket? We then see what's up with Matt and Karen. They seem to be living in Matt's dad's old place. We get inside of Karen's head for a bit. She feels more at peace being around Matt. While that's happening, Ben, Glory, Officer Blanders, and Coogan, and the random cop go to meet Lois to get her confession. Unfortunately for them, the Kingpin has a plant at the police station. Back at the Kingpin's home base, Fisk is laying on thick to nuke. I noticed that Fisk said that Nuke is a super soldier. Unless he said that just to glaze him, that's interesting and would make some sense based on how he was moving earlier. Also, since the start of this issue, we keep seeing him take different color pills. Is that to keep him both physically and mentally stable? Anyway, after prying on Nuke's patriotism, he lets him loose. Elsewhere, Matt is working at a crappy diner and tries to duck out before Ben or Glory sees him. Matt senses something weird. A helicopter, but not a normal one. It's Nuke. 
He doesn't just shoot up the diner. He blows it up with a freaking rocket launcher. What's worse is while he was sent to kill Yurik, he's trying to take everyone in that city block out. And I'm talking about any building around him, including the one where Karen and Matt were living at. I honestly can't tell if Karen is hurt or not since she's been severely cracked out since the story began. After Nuke takes out a cop helicopter, the only one standing in front of him, Matt in his daredevil costume. The issue opens with even more destruction. You know, with Nuke firing at Daredevil like this reminds me of a video game. Contra, maybe? Nuke continues to light up everything, creating a almost literal ring of hellfire. Nothing Daredevil does can stop him. Nuke doesn't feel any pain. His bones don't break. So Matt does the only reasonable thing. Electrocute him. Even that, and falling about 50 feet into a cop car doesn't stop him. Ben and Gloria are watching this, and she keeps getting in the way. Nuke's copter takes this opportunity to take Ben out, but they hit Gloria instead. Daredevil is able to take down the copter with one of Nuke's guns. Conveniently, the Avengers arrive. Okay, it's just the big ones, Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man. And they take Nuke back. To where? Well, we'll see in a minute. Back at the Kingpin's place, he's having a business discussion with the Syndicate. It looks like hundreds of people died, but even worse, they lost a lot of money in the drug trade. Why couldn't Luke just take out all these guys? A Mr. Glazer decides to give Fisk a piece of his mind. That was dumb to do, however, he still might be able to limp away from that. But then he decided to speak about the Kingpin's wife. And then, well... It looks like most of the injured people couldn't make it to the hospital, so they had to hold up in Sister Maggie's church. Karen's there too, but after a moment together with Matt, he darts to another building because he senses Captain America. During their quick chat, it seems Nuke is mostly man-made. Probably human muscles and skeleton. His skin is made of different plastics, and he doesn't burn easily. What is he? The Bionic Man? Steve Austin? Stretch Armstrong? This case is exceptionally more personal to Cap because this guy parades around the American flag. I wonder what he thought when Norman Osborn scored one as Iron Patriot. Oh wait, Cat was dead at that time, N never mind. Later on, Fisk is on the phone with a general that he has controlled under his thumb and tells him to brush this little mess away. As that's happening, Cat bursts in, Wayne answers, but the general just says, nah. Not liking that response, Cap decides to get answers his own way. Elsewhere, the general is letting Nuke know that he needs to go on a little vacation outside of the States. Nuke doesn't take that well. He snaps and takes out everyone in the room minus the general. Cap, meanwhile, finds out that the government is still keeping Project Rebirth going, aka the Super Soldier Project. The government tested on 20 men, 19 died. The only survivor was an Agent Simpson, a.k.a. Nuke. You know how everything in the MCU seems to lead back to the Super Soldier program? Well, yeah, this is a new. It was even happening in comics almost 40 years ago. Nuke is blowing everyone that's in front of him away, and this snaps Cap out of his shock, and he engages with Nuke. They wind up knocking themselves through a couple buildings, and this scene reminds me of a scene from the Kite anime. Cap recovers and tries to get Nuke to the authorities, but several copters, I'm not sure if it's government or the kingpins, but at this point it's the same thing, start trying to remove them from the story. Daredevil arrives just in time to save them. Uh, sorta. Matt is rushing to get Nuke to the hospital and Cap is in pursuit. Nuke doesn't make it. Daredevil was able to get Nuke's lifeless body to the Daily Bugle though. Sometime later, we see a very perturbed Wilson Fisk. Everyone is against him. From former hitmen, the Daily Bugle, the government, which is creating Senate subcommittees, community groups, ex-employees, and so on. Even the men that work underneath him have lost their faith in him. Despite that, most of the charges either won't stick or will be stuck in legality for years, but that's not the point. He can't ever pretend to be a simple spice seller ever again. Everyone knows his true colors, his true nature. All because of one man he thinks, Matt Murdock. The truth though is, he let his obsessive desire, his lack of control, 
overtake his reasoning. The story ends with a happy Matt and a noticeably more healthy looking Karen walking down the street.